copy it to a jump drive also, and then I'm going to see if I can post that. We're, just, we're going to figure out a way to get the content from Monday available to you as well. I think this is working now, so we had to do some updating. I, I installed a new Teams app, but there was an update on the hard drive that had to be made in order for it to work properly. So I finally figured that out, and it appears to be transcribing and sound and all looks okay now. So I would appreciate if someone in the class, or a few of you maybe, could at some point, you know, this afternoon, text me and say, it's good. We can see it. It's running. So I would appreciate that. All right. Cases, the neuron was releasing some chemical, and we called it a neurotransmitter. So, uh, like when the when the motor neuron makes the muscle contract, it releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Remember that? So, I'm about to to tell you that neurons can do something very different than that. So there there are two little clusters of neurons. Each of them are on both sides of the third ventricle. Collectively, um, each totals maybe eight to 10,000 cells, like people have counted them. <laughs> and so there are two spots. You can see um, each of these spots right here. This one is called the supraoptic nucleus, and this one the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus. Remember, just to remind you about vocabulary here, if you say nucleus and you're talking about the nervous system, you're not talking about the organelle with the DNA in it. You're talking about a functional group of cells. Like these cells are responsible for doing something. And in the fall, we identified these clusters of cell bodies as places where the brain looks darker. Because the cell bodies aren't myelinated. So it makes it look red. 
when you cut a brain and you look at it, some of it's gray, like the cortex is all gray, and there are these spots in the middle that have gray in them. And we said those are little clusters. In neuro terms, we call those nuclei. So they have functional meaning. So these two, the supraoptic and paraventricular the nucleus, each have functions in the hormone system of my body. Like, here's what I mean by that. The two hormones made, both of them are made in both spots, are hormones that are actually endocrine hormones. Like you think, well, the adrenal gland makes adrenaline, and adrenaline goes about my body and does stuff. Okay, the supraoptic nucleus, the cluster of neurons, and the paraventricular nucleus, the cluster of neurons, make hormones. Those two hormones are known as, you sit over here, oxytocin and ADH. The ADH stands for anti-diuretic hormone. So we're going to talk about each one of these um, as our first two hormones for this um, um, in our list. They're each made in the paraventricular or PVN and the supraoptic or SON, supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. They are transported, those hormones are transported by way of the axons of those neurons into the posterior pituitary gland where they are stored. They will then be released into circulation, not by the hypothalamus, but by the posterior pituitary. So because this is such a unique arrangement, the posterior pituitary is oftentimes is given another name. And so I'm looking for it on the slide here. It's really important, so I want you guys to add it here. It is oftentimes, because of this, it is oftentimes called the neuro hypothesis. HYPO means under, and so it's very common for people to call the adrenal gland the hypothesis. HYPO, P-H-Y-S-I-S, the hypothesis. And so this connection here is said to be a connection called the connection with the neuro hypothesis. Let me see if this helps. If you have a pituitary gland that you dissect it and you cut it and you stain it, different types of things in my body, and here I'm thinking epithelial connected, muscle nervous, different types of tissues stain differently with different kinds of stain. And so, like you could take me in the lab and you just pick up any random slide out and hold it up. I'm not looking through the microscope, I can just see the variations in color on there, and you say, hey, Warren, what, what kind of tissue is this? And without looking under a microscope, I can tell you, because they stain differently, like the intensity of the stain is different. So if you tell me it's an HD stain, I know immediately what you're talking about when you show it to me. If it's epithelial, connected, or nervous. So the reason I say that is because the posterior side of the pituitary gland stains like nervous tissue. Like you wouldn't know this is not brain, but it's actually a gland. So the axons here extend down into this area and it creates a kind of brain extension into the posterior pituitary. All right, so let's talk about each hormone. Uh, first, oxytocin. I think I have some images here that'll help. I put pictures of them in, sometimes I take them out, and I did in this case, did I? I should look full class. All right, it's, the structure is not important. Um, it is kind of cool to, uh, to look at. Okay, back to the thing. Okay, so oxytocin um, is a peptide, a tiny protein. Now, I told you I was gonna tell you this with these guys. If I say that, everybody goes, immediately. It's a peptide or a protein, it's made out of amino acids. Everybody goes, I know what it has to do in order to make something happen. It has to bind to a membrane-bound receptor, 
activated dentalate cyclase, G protein, cyclic AMP, protein kinase. That's immediately in your head here. So oxytocin has as its major function uh, uh, in the reproductive system of females. Its role in male physiology is still debated to this day. But we do know it plays important roles in the female reproductive system. So let me give you a, a rundown of it. Um, so the way you run down hormones is you talk about where the receptors are. Like I know it's gonna act there because there's receptors for it. So the two places where you find oxytocin receptors are in the uterus and in the ducts of mammary glands. So here's how it works. Whenever it's time to have a child, the woman is completing her gestational period. The child is developed, it's time for childbirth. A signal starts the process of parturition or labor. The baby is going to be born now. We have begun. And so what that signal is and where it comes from is also a matter of current research. Nobody really knows exactly what that signal is. Do you think that would be useful to know what that signal is? There's reason to be looking for it, yeah? We do know what the outcome of that signal is. The signal causes an elevated level of oxytocin. Now, we do take advantage of this in the medical setting because if, if you are 42 weeks gestation and dying inside because you're so miserable, it is not hard to talk your OBGYN to putting you in the hospital and inducing labor. And they're gonna do so with a synthetic, a man-made produced hormone that binds to oxytocin receptors. And its name actually sounds like it. The name of this drug is pitocin. Do you hear it? Oxytocin, pitocin. And so whenever the oxytocin produced here and released by the posterior pituitary binds to the uterus, it's in, the receptors are in the muscle of the uterus. When they bind there, it causes those muscles to contract. And when they contract, at this point, the baby's head is turned down at the cervix and beginning to make its way through the vaginal canal. And as those cervical muscles squeeze down on the baby's head, there is a sensory pathway. This is also cool, but you know, we gotta stop somewhere. Um, a sensory pathway that instructs this system to produce and release oxytocin again. And so as soon as that signal from the uterus reaches the brain, it will cause another round of oxytocin to be released into circulation. And it takes a bit for that oxytocin to make its way through circulation and get to the uterus, it's in the blood vessels, and here comes another contraction. This contraction is a little bit stronger, and it tells the brain the contraction is stronger, and in response, this system will produce another round of oxytocin, and with each round, the levels of oxytocin released are ratcheted up. And if you're in the hospital and they have a monitor on you, you can look at the screen and see when the oxytocin arrives. Because the uterus will squeeze down and you'll see a peak. And then the squeeze ends. Here comes the next round of oxytocin. There goes the next one. And so this is a positive feedback cycle. Each round causes the system to produce more hormone and more hormone causes an increase in the intensity of the contraction. So what you're doing by giving the drug Pitocin is actually facilitating the beginning of a positive feedback loop that will ultimately result in the delivery of the child. Very cool. 
Now, the other place oxytocin is found is in the ducts of the mammary glands. So mammary tissue is really, uh, it is, it has been developing already, and I'll say just another word about that here in just a second, because of a different hormone called prolactin. So as the woman has developed, um, her mammary tissue has developed as well as a result of another hormone. And so by the time the child is born, the breast tissue has undergone quite a bit of change in morphology. Um, the glands themselves are actually modified sweat glands. They are all, they look a lot like African glands, histologically. And they have begun to produce what we call breast milk. But that breast milk is being housed in the, in the bodies, the cell bodies of those glands, and it's not being released. Part of the reason it's not being released is the ducts that lead to the opening in the nipple are closed. They're sealed shut. So you're, you're building up this amount of material. The first of it looks a little bit different from um, the days that follow, called the claustrum. But the stuff is extraordinarily high in antibodies and stuff that's really good for the newborn. And there's no way to get it out. But during the process of childbirth, oxytocin is hitting those ducts. And so what are they doing? They're opening. Yeah, the oxytocin in the duct of the mammary gland causes it to dilate. And so in most cases that I know of, it is very soon after the baby's born, they're going to ask the mother to begin nursing. Yes? Some of you know this, you've had sisters, brothers, children, it's what they do. It's like this, this young lady has been through the most traumatic experience of her life. Now, here, take this baby and let it nurse. Hard times um, for survival of the human race. Oxytocin's played a role in this. So the baby's gonna get some of this claustrum. The other interesting note here is that nursing here for the child to nurse will activate the same sensory pathway that the oxytocin pathway used for the uterus during birth, which means there will be a secondary positive feedback cycle to follow when the baby nurses. It will cause yet another circulating positive feedback cycle to elevate oxytocin levels. This has two functions. One, it's going to keep the ducts open so the baby can get what it needs. Second, it is going to cause the continued contraction of the muscular wall of the uterus. Now, why would that be important? Because the uterus, which is about the size of a pear, during pregnancy becomes the size of a beach ball. And in a moment, there's nothing in it. And so you've got all of this mass of tissue, which creates a potential clinical issue now, because there is cellular material inside the uterus. It cannot stay there, because there, it, you will develop secondary infections if you do so. So the nursing, opening the ducts for the mammary glands, so the child can get what it needs, is also going to be causing the contraction of the uterus to expel any remaining cellular debris that's in the uterus and to reshape it. Now, if you choose not to nurse, and you tell them not doing that, even if you choose to nurse, it's likely this will happen. But if you don't, it's for sure gonna happen. The nurse is gonna come in the room Take their fist, they're gonna get on the bed with you, take their fist and begin to knead, like dough, the pelvic area, in order to help the uterus expel what's there. Because it's dangerous to leave that stuff in there. Oxytocin. Number two, 
is ADH. Uh, as I said, it stands for antidiuretic hormone. Uh, some textbooks will refer to this hormone as vasopressin. In fact, when I have you watch the video next week, it's the video uh, person calls it vasopressin and has a lot to say about it. So let me tell you a little bit about it, um, ADH or vasopressin. If you get, yeah. Can you spell the name of it? Mm -hmm. V-A-S-O, pressin. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so ADH or vasopressin, you might think it looks really similar to oxytocin. It's only two amino acids different. So it's a peptide, you think, well, maybe they're doing the same thing. They have nothing to do with each other, nothing. The ADH or vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone, has its receptors. The receptors for this hormone are in the kidneys. They're in the kidneys. And the role of ADH is to cause the kidney tubes to develop additional water channels for the purposes purposes of reabsorption of water. Now, I wish uh, that I could somehow fast forward to April and walk you through the ADH binding and the distal convoluted tubule, because now you would go, oh, that would have been helpful <laughs> to know. But for now, I'm going to leave it alone. That's all you know so far. Let me add something, just a, a side note to it that will help you remember it, all right? Uh, the receptors that ADH binds to in the kidney are blocked by alcohol. And alcohol binds competitively to these receptors. So let me tell you what it does again, and then add, put those two together, and then we'll leave it. ADH is called antidiuretic hormone. It binds to receptors in the kidney, and it facilitates the production of water channels that allows the kidney to reabsorb water. By reabsorbing, I mean keep it in your body. Keep it in circulation. Like your kidneys are filtering it, and if it stays in there, it's gonna be urine. ADH says, uh-uh. If we put all that water out in the urine, I'm dehydrated, so I'm gonna keep the water in the body by reabsorbing it, moving it back into circulation. That's what that is. So alcohol, binds to those ADH receptors and blocks the binding of ADH. Simple illustration will suffice. When my children were little, now both of my girls are married and have girls of their own. And so I'm about to start this cycle again. I'm looking forward to it. Like within the next three or four years, I will do to my granddaughters what I did to my own daughters here. Very effective. We're gonna go for a trip. As soon as they can talk to Doc and tell him what they want, I will give it to them. And one of the things I'm going to give to them is the gift of going to some big college hoorah hoop to do thing. Either um, in Aggieland, where I did all of my um, research work, or Baton Rouge. I prefer going to Aggieland, but the same things are happening in both places. On the Saturday in October, y'all seen this before? Thousands of people are on campus, and the smells are just like glorious, yeah? All the cooking of the food and the barbecuing, massive coolers of alcohol everywhere. The ambient temperature is somewhere near 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At the end of each exit, so you're walking around campus, y'all just notice, next time you do this, at the, look down at the end of the road, at the end of that road, there will be an ambulance there. And between the ambulance and the people, you're nodding, you've seen it, yes? And between the ambulance and the people all on campus, there will be roads, like there will be a place where there will be porta johns, maybe 20 of them. Yeah? You've seen it. And they're all, people are all lined up there, yeah? And what I do is I tell, tell my daughters, we went several times, I said, no, I just don't look at them, okay? Listen. As we walk by, just listen. What we're listening for are some key phrases. One of the key phrases is, man, it's burning up out here. Throw me another cold one. <laughs> Am I wrong? So these people are, I'm so thirsty. Let's drink another cold beer. 
<laughs> the line at the port of John is 50 people long. Before, no, before you know it, somebody's laying on the ground, unconscious, and here comes the boys in the ambulance, <laughs> yeah, and they stick a needle in there, and what do they put in the needle? Liquid, because the alcohol is binding to the ADH receptor, blocking the reabsorption of water, which means the water is being excreted. The drinking of the alcohol is actually working in the exact opposite direction that these knuckleheads <laughs> think it's going to work. People who take anatomy and physiology don't do stupid stuff like that. You've been educated, people, yeah? So if you are around your friends and this is happening, now I have put you in an awkward position because you've been educated and now you have the moral ethical responsibility to tell your friends how stupid they are. Yeah? I don't want to hear it. So I, I really appreciate all the smiles because you guys have seen this and experienced it. I always bring that up with ADH. It makes the students smile. All right. Next up is the connection from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. So notice that the neurons here are in a different place than the hypothalamus. And notice, whenever they make their hormones, those hormones are actually being collected by a capillary bed at the base of the brain, between the brain and the hypothalamus. Y'all see that? So for the last one, the hormones were made and transported all the way to the gland by way of axons. For this connection, for the anterior pituitary connection, the axons terminate here at the base of the hypothalamus and release the hormone there. So this little pocket here on the bottom of the hypothalamus called the median eminence, y'all have to know that. That little pocket right there is a collection spot for hormones produced by the hypothalamus. And each, each hormone has its own little cluster. And here is the list of hormones that are made. So you don't have to list them right now. I have a slide to show you and I'm gonna list them for you, all right? So just hold on that. Those hormones are collectively, we know those hormones as either release, releasing hormones or release inhibiting hormones. Um, for the most part, it's not exclusively true, for the most part, these hormones don't do anything that we think of as physiology. They cause the production of something, of another hormone. They don't actually go out to the gland and do something. They, they're gonna tell the anterior pituitary to make another hormone. So they're either release hormones or release inhibiting hormones, and they are collected by the capillaries in the base of the hypothalamus. So now, what I'm saying is, these hormones are actually endocrine hormones. They're in circulation. Now, this capillary bed at the base of the hypothalamus is connected directly to the anterior pituitary. Its connection is blood vessels, not neurons. These blood vessels that connect the, um, the hypothalamic capillary bed to the anterior pituitary capillary bed are known as portal vessels. So, we will see two portal systems in this class that are really important for anatomy and physiology. This is the first one. So let's define what we mean by portal system. <coughs> normally in circulation, normally in circulation, the artery comes from the heart, feeds a capillary bed. The capillary bed goes into the veins and the veins go back to the heart. Now, all of you should have come to class today with that as working knowledge about the circulatory system. Artery leaves the heart, goes to the capillaries, the veins go back to the heart. Everybody should have come to me today with that. That's normal. Two places in the body, this is the first one that we'll learn about. Two places in the body, a capillary bed does not drain into a vein that returns to the heart. Instead, it drains into a vein that feeds another capillary bed. So portal systems, have an extra capillary bed. 
that's important. Uh, so here you can see they are referred to as the hypothesial portal veins. And the GI will call them hepatic portal veins. So this is the first introduction to portal systems. There's an extra capillary there. Now, whenever the release or release inhibiting hormones reach the anterior pituitary gland, they are going to cause the release of another hormone. These hormones are going to have impacts all over the body. These are the anterior pituitary hormones. So let me show you a summary picture that's very helpful in remembering these. And um, this is out of an old textbook, but I like it because it just puts it all in one place. So these hormones up here are the ones made in the hypothalamus. So that's this list right here. These black arrows right here, those black arrows right there, represent the portal vessels. So this black arrow or that one, I could point to any of them, represent these blue portal vessels. They are connected then to cells, the capillary bed and cells of the anterior pituitary. And when they get there, when these hormones get there, they will cause the production or the inhibition of production of another group of hormones. These are called the hormones of the anterior pituitary and they will have widespread effects in the human body. So those are the two master control systems for the hypothalamic pituitary axis. A posterior connection for oxytocin and ADH an anterior connection that's a portal system that results in widespread impacts in lots of places in the body. So the rest of our time together is gonna to have to be spent here. Like what, what is all that? <laughs> all right, now let me show you, um, I have put tables, I don't like teaching like this. And so I'm gonna say it, but um, there are, this is some people like this, like give it to me succinctly in one place where I can read it and study it. So y'all see this table 16.3? That is in your book, right there. Oxytocin is a peptide coming from paraventricular nucleus neurons, stimulated due to the stretching of the cervix and suckling. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so I'm just showing you that these tables are going to sound like me as I talk about these hormones. So there's the posterior pituitary. This is the first one that um, your book talks about for the anterior pituitary. This one is growth hormone. So instead of just reading these to you, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the table, but then I'm gonna go to a picture to help teach you, right? Because I don't, I don't want you to stand here. This is stimulated by the growth hormone releasing hormone, blah, blah, right? I, I wanna actually teach you what's happening. Okay, so I just show you these tables, I put them in the presentation. So when you're studying, like you think you got it, go to the table, block it out, and see if you can write in what these hormones do, and then you know you got it. Okay, so let's do growth hormone first. <clears throat> um, so if I ask people in here uh, about growth hormone, my suspicion is this is the kind of thing that comes to your mind first. Is that true? like something is wrong with the pituitary gland. It's not making growth hormones. Yeah? Something is wrong with the pituitary gland. It's making too much growth hormone. So this is dwarfism and gigantism. There's another clinical word that's used for somebody who has completed their skeletal development. Um, and is an adult and has a growth hormone um, anomaly called acromegaly. I'm not gonna ask you that on the test, but you've probably seen it um, in uh, people at some point in your life, somewhere on a picture or video. Some individual has really odd looking cheekbones that protrude and a really large, thick mandible. 
They may be way too tall, they might not be. If they're not, they'll give these huge, they look like big bony knots where the greater tubercles are and stuff. It's like their skeleton has kind of masked up on them because of the release of <coughs> extra growth hormone. Uh, so I, for physiology students, you need to know uh, some of the background in terms of what the hormone is for. This picture does it beautifully. There's a couple of surprising things here, I think. You tell me. Um, can we just, let's just drop this nugget in there. Because I know I got some, uh, some people in here who are athletes, pitchers, or baseball, softball. Uh, so uh, there was a very famous story, a scandal in Major League Baseball about 15 years ago. I uh, see some nodding. Uh, where growth hormone was being administered by this agent, a couple of New York Yankees pitchers, Clemens and Andy Pettit, both were busted with this because of the ability of this hormone to help in the repair of injury. And so, I mean, the question comes down, just drop the nugget in and then we'll look at it. Like, why not let them have it? So let's see if we can get to it uh, with this. Why is it not legal? Okay, so let's start up here. This says um, that growth hormone, releasing hormone, um, that would come from the hypothalamus, would be increased. Like your hypothalamus, your brain is gonna say, it's go time for growth hormone. Give me some during stage four sleep. Now, I, I, my suspicion is that none of you came to class with that information in your head. Just think about, think about life development. Children, teenagers, adults. What is the tendency for sleep? Yeah, it's all related to this growth hormone thing. And what this doesn't tell you, what your textbook doesn't tell you is, there's actually a circadian rhythm of growth hormone. It's one of the strongest hormone daily rhythms that humans experience. Is sleep important? Well, if you're talking about growth hormone, you bet it is. Okay, so deep sleep is a major feature of stimulating the hypothalamus to get growth hormone. Uh, a decline in blood sugar block, stop right there. Increases in exercise or stress can also increase growth hormone, releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and cause elevation. Okay, so what does it mean? What does it mean to have growth hormone levels increase? All right, so let's skip down now. Growth hormone has been released from the anterior pituitary and it's in the system. What does it do? Okay, so notice this has direct and indirect actions. And so from this image, most of you probably thought when you came to class today that growth hormone doing this is a direct impact, but it is not. In fact, when you look at your intro picture right here, the growth hormone on this side over here, you see growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone, and where is it at? It acts on bone and muscle adipose tissue. Is that right? No, it is not right. It's kind of right. <laughs> so here's what's right. Uh, look at this. The ind it has indirect actions by causing the liver primarily to produce what are called insulin-like growth factors. Why? Why would I call it? It's growth hormone is causing it. Why am I calling it an insulin-like growth factor? must have something to do with sugar, <laughs> yeah? It must look similar to something that has to do with glucose um, and insulin. Okay, so here's what it does, IGFs cause increased skeletal growth, cartilage growth, and protein synthesis and cell growth and proliferation. Y'all, this, this thing right here is why the athletes want it. 
because the stress put on a professional athlete's body causes lots of deterioration of cartilage, the connective tissues around the bones, that's extra skeletal tissue, so all the ligaments and tendons, and then this thing right here, protein synthesis. Like the collagen that is used to build the bone and the tissue is actually torn up by these athletes. And growth hormone, by way of the liver, can actually promote its repair. I like the way that sounds a lot. But of course, that's not the end of the story because the actual direct actions of growth hormone are to increase blood glucose levels and to have anti-insulin effects. Now, why would that be dangerous? This, this, this line item right here is the reason why this stuff is illegal. You can't just go get it at Walmart. This is it right here. It increases blood sugar and has other anti-insulin effects. Duh. Why is that dangerous? So I'm just gonna put a big one out there. We could, I could blather on about this for an hour. But here's a big one. The negative effects of high sugar will impact every critical body system. And the easiest way to illustrate that is with type one diabetics. Ask a cardiac person, anybody who has cardiac training, give me the risk factors for problems in the cardiac system. Normally they'll say number one, smoking or tobacco use, because these are the most people who are dying in their care, smokers. Number two, people have trouble regulating sugar. So this is gonna be a big topic for us. This sugar story is gonna keep coming. This is the first time you've heard me mention it, but it's just gonna keep coming. Elevated sugar levels, the body seems to think that's a good thing because so many different hormones cause elevations in sugar. You already heard about one, epinephrine, adrenaline causes increases in sugar. That's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are all these systems, hormone systems, designed to jack sugar levels up. Those sugar levels are for survival they're for stress conditions. And if you do it unnaturally, then you end up damaging cardiovascular, that's the big one, the heart and the blood vessels. Somebody with high sugar levels over the course of their lifetime, they're gonna, they're gonna have damage in their retina. Capillaries are gonna be busting up in their retina. They're gonna have brittle capillaries in the periphery so that after long-term high glucose exposure, they're gonna go in and have an infection on their big toe, they're gonna to have to amputate their whole foot because it won't heal. Because the blood vessels have been brittleized by the high sugar levels. I can just go on, yeah? It's not good. Stress is not good. And growth hormones, direct action, is equal to, is equal to the impacts of stress on the human body. Meaning it's not healthy. And so Major League Baseball said, I understand that this is going to help your tissues repair, but we're not going to let you do that without prescription, without you know, legal things to help you with the growth hormone. That's why. All right. Great. That's growth hormone. I thought maybe you guys would have a question or two there as I was blathering about that. Y'all feel pretty good about this? Yes. I kind of have like a clinical question. So could like, so you know how when you're, when you're going through the pain, you, get, you can get a steroid injection to get the pain. Could that be done with growth hormones? Like, cause it, cause of the cartilage repair? Uh, or is it, or is that still direct? No, no, absolutely right. And it's interesting because as far as I'm concerned, you don't know anything about cortisol injections yet. <clears throat> but it's coming. Like by the end of class Wednesday, you're gonna hear me talking about this and I'm gonna point out something on the cortisol thing. I'm gonna ask the question, like, so you got a shot in your knee and it feels a lot better. I got a shot in my shoulder, it feels a lot better. Three weeks later, it's hurting again, but they won't give me another shot. 
Why not? So very similar conversation. Cortisol also increases the level of sugar. But that's not all the cortisol does. It also inhibits immunity. That's why the inflammation is helped by the cortisol. So it's a great question. They're related. Cortisol is the human body's stress hormone. Like if you say, just type in Google, stress hormone. Cortisol is the hormone. And it causes elevations in sugar. All right, so we'll return to it. All right, let's do one more. Let's do the thyroid and then be done for the day. The thyroid gland here, as you can see, is located in your throat, just below your voice box. So if you guys can all palpate right here, this is your larynx, right? Anatomy and physiology students who are trained at Louisiana Christian University do not say the word larynx, right? The word is larynx. The Y is before the N. If you say larynx, you sound like a buffoon. <laughs> and if somebody asked you where you were trained, where were you trained? Not here. East Texas Baptist University. <laughs> Not here. Right. The word is larynx right here. This is your larynx. And just in here to the larynx, just lateral to it right here. There's a little piece of it that crosses in front. That's where your thyroid sits. The thyroid gland here makes uh, hormones that impact two huge things with a lot of littles. So there's a whole table in your book I'm going to show you. We're not going to go through all of them, all right? But I want to I say at least enough so that you get the impact of how important this gland is. Okay, number one job of the thyroid gland is to make thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is the hormone of metabolism. It is drive my car over to the gas station. Y'all be weird like this, I've almost got you. After a couple more months, I'm gonna make you as weird people too. And you'll do stuff like this. You open up the gas tank and you go, here comes the thyroid hormone, baby. I'm filling you up with some thyroid hormone. You put it in there and then it fires up and the engine is just burning crazy, yeah? going crazy and they're running pistons and stuff. Yeah, it's thyroid hormone, man. It is the fuel of life. It runs metabolism. It is what, um, it, it, it is what allows your metabolic rate to increase. So let's do a couple illustrations here for it, right at the very beginning, thyroid hormone. So if thyroid hormone is too high, if it's too high, your engine is running too fast. And there are some really telltale morphologies and physiologies that happen from that. Uh, for example, a person with hyperthyroidism will be, their nervous system is hyperexcited and they'll be what we would call jittery. They're jittery. They will sweat in the dead of winter. Come to class, it's 30 degrees outside, it's horrible cold in here and they're just, their shirts are wet, they're sweating. They're hot all the time. If you look at their eyes, hyperthyroid condition, the, the adipose stores around your eyes are particularly sensitive and they will deteriorate with high thyroid hormone levels and it makes the eyes look like they're bulging. It's a clinical condition called exophthalmos. So if somebody looks at you, I remember as a child, my mom had a really good friend and she scared me. I was a kid and I, I, let, I didn't want to talk to her because it, it always looked like she was, you know, looking at me. <laughs> she, she had Graves' disease. She was hyperthyroid. And so this, she had uh, exophthalmos with the eyes. Um, these people tend to be uh, incredibly thin. They eat three Big Macs for lunch and they can't gain weight. Hypothyroid conditions, on the other hand, would be just the opposite of those. They eat two celery sticks every day for lunch and they still gain weight. They're cold all the time. They are mentally dull. They look bloated. 
hypothyroid, Hashimoto's disease. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the thyroid goiters before I'm done with it. But I just wanna give you a sense about the thyroid gland here up front. Um, and then before I do the details of it, let's go ahead and do that one and then we'll do the other one. Um, if, you, if you look in the book, there is, I've got a red box around this one to remind me to, to mention at least a couple of these. So this is table 16.4 and it's all the functions of thyroid hormone in your body. So without doing details, let's just think about it. Ward's already mentioned the metabolic rate. <coughs> Fat metabolism, the nervous system, cardiovascular, muscular, skeletal, GI. The reason I list all these for you is to say, is there anything about human physiology that thyroid hormone does not impact? Everything. It impacts everything. Yeah. Okay. So here's the second one. I'll stop with this. The second hormone type, and then I'll show you the details on Wednesday next week. The second type of hormone made by the thyroid gland is a hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin is made by a different group of cells in the thyroid. It's not related to the production of thyroid hormone. And this hormone is involved in calcium levels in the human body. It's involved in calcium levels. And specifically, calcitonin's level, calcitonin is secreted in response to high levels of calcium in circulation. I would guess nobody in here has ever heard of it. I think probably some of you have heard about parathyroid hormone and the low blood calcium. We'll talk about that one too on Wednesday. But high calcium, so what I'm saying is the thyroid calcitonin is actually a bone building hormone. It takes calcium out of circulation and puts it in the bones. It makes your bones stronger, calcitonin. All right, now what we want to do before we finish with this thyroid is um, there's a couple of things that will, I think, be helpful for us. We just point it out here, I'll let you go. Um, if you guys will learn the feedback mechanism for the regulation of the hormone, you can explain things like thyroid goiters. So I want to do that. And then I want to talk about the structure of the hormone because if you understand the role of iodine in the production of thyroid hormone, then you can talk about some of this treatment stuff for thyroid cancers. Like a good friend of ours was diagnosed with a thyroid cancer. He was put into quarantine. And he said, wait, why are they putting me in quarantine? They're gonna give me um, radioactive iodine. And I said, that's why, Mr. Howard, because you are hot. He liked that. <laughs> You're hot, you're radioactively hot. What they do is, this is one way to treat hyperthyroidism, is to inject into the body, IV, radioactive iodine. Because iodine is used for one thing only in human physiology, and that is the production of thyroid hormone. So if you put iodine in you, where is it gonna go? To the thyroid. And when the radioactive stuff gets there, it starts burning the thyroid tissue specifically. So by injecting radioactive iodine, you can burn 